Welcome to the Women in STEM podcast that focuses on the intersectionality of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We focus on how we can amplify the voices of women in STEM and make them aware of the multiple different career opportunities that are available. Today, we're thrilled to have Julie, field CTO at Tableau, joining us to discuss the exciting world of AI and analytics. Julie is a seasoned professional with a wealth of experience in the tech industry. In this episode, we'll be delving into Julie's journey into the tech industry and her passion for AI, the challenges and rewards of being a woman in tech, the future of AI and its potential to revolutionize business. Join us as we explore this topic and gain valuable insight from one of the world's leading experts in the field. Welcome to the Women in STEM podcast. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about yourself? Hello, my name is Julie Coyette. I work as field CTO at Tableau, which is part of Salesforce. So I'm passionate about data and AI since uh, I was at university, actually, nearly 20 years ago. And outside of work, I live in the mountains and I have two daughters aged six and nine. Wow, that was a great introduction. Um, We've already met before in person at a couple of tech events in Switzerland. And I really felt inspired by hearing uh, some of your workshops that you did. And we also had a chance to do kind of like an in-person interview but I felt like doing this podcast would be great for those who actually weren't there in person so can you please share a bit more about your journey and what initially drew you to specializing in AI and analytics? Yes sure so um, I studied management sciences at university together with statistics and and back then my favorite courses were econometrics and programming java programming and back then there was no specific data science course at the time but I, I was quite good with numbers and with coding so my teacher really encouraged me to focus my master thesis on what was then called data mining. And so as part of my thesis, uh, I worked as an intern at a bank in Belgium where I was building an algorithm to predict the customer next purchase of financial products. So based basically on the, the past purchases made at the bank, what was the best next purchase he will make uh, at the bank? And so my head of internship back then, uh, she was running the bank's customer insight department and she was a true inspiration. So she gave me this really great book called Scoring Points, uh, how Tesco continues to win customer loyalty. And I was actually blown away by this book because it, it really explained how Tesco loyalty program works and basically how they they became number one in the market way ahead of their competitors, but thanks to AI, thanks to data and to analytics. So I really wanted to work there and I applied for for the graduate program. And so that's how I moved to London to start my career in data. And I don't know if you've heard before the expression data is a new oil. No, I haven't heard of that. No, so that is a new one. It's quite an old expression that was coined for the first time back, I think, in 2004 or six by Clive Humby, uh, who was mm-hmm. my former CEO. And, and he was a founder of Dun Humby, the company behind Tesco Loyalty Card. And what he meant by data is a new oil is that, of course, like oil, data is valuable, right? But he said that, of course, if unrefined, it cannot really be used. So it has to be changed into something like gas, plastic, or chemicals, et cetera, really to to create a valuable entity uh, and to drive a profitable activity from it. And basically, data has to be as well broken down and analyzed for it to get value. You You need to get insights out of the data to get full value from your data, basically. And that's that's the analogy you made. Basically, uh, uh, as a data scientist, what I really loved uh, is really the type of very varied and deep work that you need uh, as a, to be to be data scientist. Well, you first need to be to be good with numbers, right? You need to be quite good at programming. Uh, of course, it may change quite a lot with generative AI, but we will come to that uh, later. And you also need to be focused on the business value of what you are building. 
And so I really loved it because it was really creative, but as well very structured and, and methodic. Uh, so I got to work on really impactful projects there, uh, harnessing my curiosity, and, and, and yeah, that was great back then. Great. And, you know, you've had over 15 years of career. It sounds like you're very well experienced. Are there any particular highlights from specific projects that you've worked on that have been particularly impactful or kind of like stood out to you? Yes, I have a few. So first at Tesco, one of the most impactful projects I worked on was actually to rebuild Tesco's main customer segmentation called the lifestyle. So basically it groups customer together based on the type of products that people buy in store and online. And so we had about back then 16 million customers with a loyalty card. Uh, the loyalty card was called Club Card. And it meant that we had really a huge amount of data to analyze and gain insights from. And so what we did at Tesco, we created an algorithm that is called Rolling Ball, which would basically flag all of the products and give them a score based on how similar they are from each other. And so we created two lifestyle dimensions from that. And we scored then each customer against this, uh, this lifestyle dimension to segment each customer. So that for example, if, if you only bought mainly spices, fresh, fresh herbs, uh, raw fish and, and meat, you would be put automatically in the final food segment. Whereas if you bought uh, in the supermarket a lot of promotions and, and Tesco own label products, you would be part of the price sensitive segment. So that was really impactful because they could better target uh, the marketing campaigns thanks to two really powerful segments. And yeah, so that was one example of project. And then I want to share as well with you another one which was really impactful for me. Uh, so. After my time at Tesco, I returned actually to Belgium and I started working on the other side of the industry. So I joined a, a tech or software company uh, to help and advise SaaS customers in the data and analytics journey. And there, one of the most impactful project was uh, when I worked for the Belgian uh, Ministry of Finance, so public sector in fraud detection. And, and so there, what we did is that we built a hybrid fraud detection model, which basically used a mix of network analysis, advanced predictive algorithms, and then business rules. And, and by using a combination of two techniques, uh, this model was actually so good at predicting fraud star company that we actually eradicated completely this type of complex tax fraud. And so it really saved millions of euro every year to the Belgian government. Um, and then it got scaled up to, to Europe. And, and you can really see the value of analytics and data science. Really, they are working on impactful projects like this one. Wow, that sounds like so cool. As a field CTO at Tableau, like what is your day-to-day -day role involved? And how do you help contribute to Tableau's visions for the customer and contributing to the advancement of AI within the company? Yes, great question. So um, as field CTO at Tableau, I really focus on bridging the gap between technology and the needs of our customer. So I, I leverage the AI expertise I got uh, working closely with the product team or product team to provide customer feedback so that we create new AI capabilities that really reflect what our customer needs today in the market. So I really stay ahead of the new AI trends uh, that are coming. Uh, I try to identify innovative use case for AI within the Tableau platform. And then as well on a daily basis, I engage with strategic customers to really understand their needs and demonstrate how Tableau can really solve their business challenges. So I also create some assets uh, that can be used uh, strategically to really elevate and scale our messaging across the organization. 
And given your extensive experience, what are some of the major trends that you are forecasting that you see that are going to be shaping the future of data analytics in, let's say, the next five to 10 years? And what do you think these advancements in AI will influence, influence these trends? And how can businesses leverage? Yeah, great question. So first, uh, without AI, I have to re-emphasize one thing first. So I believe it's really important to realize that analytics today is actually far from being commoditized. So I mm -hmm. hear very often in the data community that analytics is a commodity, but actually it's not at all. So analytics is not only about creating charts or visualizations. Of course, creating charts is probably commoditized. There are many tools available out there that allows you to create charts quite easily. But creating charts is a vehicle to understand data. And, and it's actually a very small part of analytics. What is analytics? So analytics is really about extracting actionable insights from raw data to make informed decisions and to optimize processes or drive business results. And actually, this requires a lot more than just creating charts. Um, it's really a tiny little bit of it. It requires more than just translating a question into a chart as well or building beautiful dashboards. It requires really change, complete change in the organization. And so basically analytics is really meant to make not some people, but every person in an organization smarter. And we need to adapt to different persona because different persona require different data experience based on their skills, uh, on their expertise, etc. And so to really succeed and to become fully data driven, an organization really needs three key elements. They need people, they need process, and they need technology. And they need the three in combination. So technology alone won't work. You need to put the right people and the right process in place as well. But what technology will enable you is really to lower the barrier to entry. So that organization are really not dependent on a centralized data hub and everyone really feels empowered to take data-driven decisions. So technology really makes the process simpler by providing this governed self-service at scale because governance is really key if you want to deploy self-service at scale. So analytics is not just about creating more charts or dashboards, as I said it, it's really about transforming the organization, right, to empower the right people with the right insights at the right time. And if I can add as well, in the right flow of work as well. Fostering really this culture of data-driven decision-making. And actually today, this is not commoditized at all. So now let's go back to, to your your question that you just asked, because I didn't answer it fully. Um, how do we enable this data culture and what are the big trends that are coming, right? Well, of course, I think AI will play a huge role in the future of analytics. And I actually see two different roles of AI for data and analytics. The first role of AI, which has been actually around for a long time, with other AI techniques, apart from generative AI, which existed for a very long time. Techniques like pattern recognition, uh, predictive AI. So the huge value there of analytics with AI is to extract meaningful insights from data. For example, calculating scores and predictions from historical data to make more proactive decisions. And second, and this is a new role of AI, and particularly with generative AI, is that will completely revolutionize uh, the way people engage with data because it will lower completely the barrier to entry even further by enabling basically everyone to talk to the data in natural languages. And so, for example, uh, at Tableau, we are launching Einstein Copilot, which is a generative AI powered assistant really designed to accelerate accelerate your data analysis by automating all of the tasks that you would do today, like data preparation, uh, data exploration, and some governance tasks. So it really enhances your productivity 
allowing users to really ask natural language questions, all, of course, while maintaining data privacy and security. So it makes it basically easier for experts analysts, but as well novice users, to derive meaningful insights quickly and efficiently. And another big thing we brought to the market at Tableau to, to help uh, with this as well is this new unique data experience that, are, that is called Tableau Pulse, data-driven decision-making for anyone. So it's really, um, it's a new solution uh, that is powered by AI that will basically allow you to have a cockpit view of the key metrics and KPIs that you care about on the go from your mobile or embedded in any application in your flow of work. And it will bring up basically the relevant insights about any changes, in, changes into the metrics year on year, year to date, so that you also understand why and what you should do about that. And so this new experience is really designed to make any professional quickly passionate and addict to data because it's so intuitive, relevant, and personalized that it's fostered immediately to strong data culture across the organization. What's important as well now, of course, that you know, Gen AI is getting all the attention these days, it's actually we should not forget that there are other types of AI that are just as powerful. Uh, if not, sometimes even more powerful in extracting value from raw data. And, and typically pattern recognition and, and predictive AI or prescriptive AI are really key to extract those meaningful insights from data. And I think that using a combination of these techniques is really where we can optimize our approach and really unlock the full potential of AI so that we can really maximize first the value of data and second, democratize as well access to data to anyone. And so Tableau Pulse, for example, of course, leverage generative AI, but a, a lot of other types of AI are baked into the solution to really deliver this revolutionary data experience. I really like your take and how much depth you've given to that answer. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I think that you've really educated so many people on this topic because unfortunately a lot of people have some misunderstanding about AI and analytics, but I feel like you've made it really clear. And among those concerns that a lot of people have is essentially is AI going to take their jobs? You know, people are fearful that AI is going to come in and take everything over and we're going to be taken over by these robots. But I just wanted to hear your opinion on that topic. Quick break before we get back to our conversation. I want to remind you to follow, rate and review the Women in STEM podcast on whatever streaming platform. Your support really helps us to reach more listeners and continue to bring inspiring stories and valuable insights. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends and colleagues who might be interested in learning a bit more about women in STEM. Also make sure to check out our new LinkedIn page, the Women in STEM podcast, where you get to see some of the latest advancements in technology and learn more about women in STEM. And please make sure to check the bio to see where you can vote for the Women in STEM podcast. Kelly, I, I completely agree. This is one of the biggest fear I hear and I read all the time, for sure. Uh, so let me first answer this question, uh, first for the data and analytics job market, and then as well, more, general, more generally as well. Okay, so first, for data analytics uh, job market, I do not see the role of the data analyst disappearing anytime soon. On the contrary, I think we will need more and more data analysts in the future because you cannot do any AI without good and strong data foundations. So you need to clean, prepare data, ensure accuracy and reliability. You need to provide tailored insights, custom analysis based on specific business needs. And of course, AI can streamline a lot of this process, right? But human oversight is really key to ensure accuracy and relevance. And so, of course, data analysts will bring the context and the domain knowledge, right? They understand the business landscape, and that is really critical to deliver those meaningful insights to the business. 
and they can as well effectively communicate those insights to decision makers. So of course, it will play a big role there, but I think it will enhance the role of data analysts and not replace them. So analysts should leverage AI tools to enhance their skills and efficiency um, exponentially, and, and you need good data to do uh, good AI for sure. And now let me uh, talk about that more broadly. So I believe that the true benefits of generative AI can only be realized through human creativity and innovation. So Gen AI ability to automate many tasks really, of course, boosts productivity and it enables deeper exploration in specific area. So it really fosters this, this huge innovation. But what AI does is basically handling a lot of repetitive tasks, right? Gen AI allows human to focus then on really more challenging, strong value added activities. And so it creates a huge amount of significant opportunities uh, to grow and to innovate better. And so many, many thought leaders and industry experts uh, have, have coined the phrase, well, AI won't replace jobs, but it will replace people who don't adapt to AI. And, and I think I agree uh, kind of with, with this because this phrase really highlights um, that um, Gen AI enhances productivity and innovation and basically those people who embrace it will actually outperform those who resist these advancements. So I think it's quite important to have this in mind and to adapt to this new technology that is growing at a huge pace because it's gonna it's, it's here to stay and to change completely the job market. So you need to leverage it to your advantage. I feel like you've definitely made some great points as to the point to the fact that people need to learn how to leverage AI and coached and advised strategic customers on their data and AI journey. Can you share some of the common challenges, common challenges that these customers face and how you over help them overcome these obstacles to unlock their full potential of their business with data? Yes, sure. So um, typically the prospects and the customer that I often interact with, they often highlight three primary challenges that they have across the organization. So the first one is data silos. So many organizations still struggle today with fragmented data that is stored across lots of the different systems. On average, I think it's like 1,000 different systems in an organization, uh, which really hinder this unified view of the data. The second challenges that I hear very often is data quality and governance. So ensuring data accuracy, consistency, um, and of course, governance with the right permissions is really crucial so that you can leverage and, and deploy to self-service analytics. But it's actually very challenging to maintain. And the third gap is this user adoption uh, or skill set gap uh, that I would say. Uh, it's, it's about you know, resisting to adopting new tools, uh, skill deficiencies, uh, which impede this effective data analytics usage within the organization. And so as part of Tableau, of course, we are quite uniquely positioned to address those challenges. So what we do is that we really collaborate closely with customers to help them leverage the Tableau platform to overcome all of those challenges, uh, implementing solution catalog, right? To provide a consistent and business friendly view of the data across the organization or flexible permission system, role level security, uh, data certification process to really enhance governance. Uh, of course, we encourage them to leverage Tableau prep uh, to clean their data. Uh, with confidence and, and reassurance on the quality of the data. Of course, uh, Tableau as well provides this tailored data experience for any kind of persona, for example, 
analysts uh, would freely explore data themselves, right, by drag and dropping or by question by asking questions to Einstein Copilot. Uh, business users would want, for example, to access directly a dashboard and interact uh, with the insights from the dashboard. Uh, while probably leaders or frontline workers, uh, they could benefit just from relevant metrics uh, integrated into their workflow using Tableau Pulse. And so by enabling basically everyone with data, we can overcome this user adoption challenge and create this data culture, which is actually key to, to become fully data driven. I feel like we're learning so much about Tableau and like how extensive and how useful it can be for the customers, which is really interesting to learn about. As a successful woman in tech, you've likely faced some unique challenges. Could you share some of the obstacles you've encountered and how you overcame them? And what strategic mindset or shift kind of help you to navigate those challenges? Yes, great question, tough question as well. Um, to be fully transparent, the biggest challenge that I faced and that I actually continue to face every day is actually public speaking. Uh, I'm quite sensitive, I think, person. And so my emotions really show externally when I speak, whenever I present publicly, so those emotions come to the surface. Uh, so basically, Public speaking, it has always been my biggest fear. Uh, and I've actually recently chosen to embrace it. And now I view each opportunity to speak as an experiment to learn from it. And so what I did to overcome this challenge is that I'm currently enrolled since a few months on this in-depth coaching program. And this program really delves into the rather than focusing on the symptoms, right, of my uh, fear, it focuses on the root cause of this fear. So it's really looking at um, what is your identity, what are my core values, what are my core beliefs or limiting beliefs as well, and basically how to align my role with, uh, with my core values to really better connect uh, with the message that I want to bring during those presentations and public speaking engagement. So it's it's quite it's been quite a tough journey, uh, but yes, yeah, the, the the new thing is that I embrace now and accept uh, this adrenaline kick that I have at the start of every presentation, and and I see now this adrenaline kick as a as a tool actually to to be more focused, and I accept it as it is. Uh, and another crucial lesson uh, that, that I learned from, from this journey and this coaching program is basically that my self-worth is, is not really dependent on others' opinions. And that's quite key because I, I'm now learning not to seek external validation, uh, but actually to find this, this validation internally within myself. And so this, this real shift in mindset it, it's really what, what helped me uh, to, to remove my fear of being judged. And, and it allows me to present more confidently because I'm, I'm less scared of the judgment for, for, from, from external audience. Another big challenge that I face, particularly, you know, uh, because I'm a, a mother with two young children, uh, and of course, it's, it's one of my core value as well, is to maintain a balance between work, family, and, and personal life. And of course, it's for sure really tough as well, but I have made this a priority. So that means each week I really organize my schedule uh, my work schedule to ensure that I spend quality time with my kids and husband and I take time for myself as well uh, because I, I love mountain sports. Uh, I do some trail running, I do skiing, hiking, mountain biking. And so what I do is um, I make it a point to really engage in at least one of these activities every week, uh, either with friends uh, or or on my own or with my husband. And, and this approach actually is what helps me 
to stay balanced. And it's actually, I realize it's actually crucial uh, to, to keep my brain focused at work. Because I notice when I don't exercise enough uh, during the week, I'm actually not as productive at work as well. I, I really appreciate your transparency with the unique challenges that you faced. I feel like a lot of people can relate to those challenges and they might even be in different industries or different uh, industries within the tech industry. And I'm sure by listening to this uh, interview, they've really gained a lot of inspiration and so much inspiration that they are considering getting into AI or data analytics. Do you have any advice that you can give them? Are there any specific skills or networks that they should be looking for? It can be very overwhelming. So I was just wondering if you could offer some advice. Yeah, for sure. So of course, so the, the demand for, for data specialists, it's something that has been increasing steadily since I started my career like 16 years ago, and it keeps increasing and growing exponentially. And so, of course, with the rise of AI, as I said, it, it, it continues to grow because you cannot do any good AI without good data. I said it already, but I think it's really important to emphasize that. And so of course it's never too late to shift your career and focus on data. Uh, it's never been the best time. It's always, well, it's the best time actually to 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 shift and to work in, in this, this domain. Um, and, and there are a lot of networks, online content, a lot of great courses available to really gain quickly a lot of data skills. Uh, for example, one website that I really found really useful when I just started my current data, but that is still really relevant today, is called Kaggle. Uh, it has lots of real uh, data sets and, and challenge and competitions to really master your data skills uh, on real world data challenges. Uh, so you can learn from others as well. It's a great community to learn from other people. Um, so I really encourage you to, to go have a look there to, to get real data uh, challenges on Kaggle. And then of course, my favorite website of all is probably Tableau Public. Uh, if you don't know it yet, Tableau Public hosts over 9 million dashboards uh, on lots of different topics. Uh, and it's powered and published by this huge data farm community, uh, the biggest community, uh, data community in the world uh, behind Tableau um, adoption. And it really fostered this kind of inspiration because you can learn from those data farm uh, people publishing great dashboards on any kind of subjects, whether it's personal, sport, uh, politics, ecological, uh, business, of course. Um, and, and, and you can just look at those dashboards, download them for yourself, learn from that, uh, from, from that dashboard to see how it was built, leverage it with your own data. Uh, so it's a great way to, to, to learn and, and to get experience with data. And on top of that, this community, they organize as well, local Tableau user groups, uh, to, to really provide the opportunity for anyone basically to, to enhance uh, your analytic skills uh, and to share different use cases that you work on. So I really encourage anyone to attend one of those local events. Uh, there are some in, in French Switzerland as well. Uh, if you're looking to improve your skills uh, and really network with other data rockstar, as I like to call them. And so it's quite important to learn continuously, of course, uh, when you want to, to start or or continue your data and analytics journey because the field of AI data and analytics is constantly evolving. And particularly with AI, it's really important to stay up to date uh, with the latest trends, the latest technology. Every, I feel like every month there's a new algorithm on generative AI, a better model, a better everything. And, and the pace is, is clearly mind blowing i mean and and you need we need to keep up with that and and understand and read uh, white papers and 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 read about thought leaders etc on that domain um what's as well important i would say it's not only about the technical expertise i think as important as the technical expertise is all of the soft skills that you may have uh, from previous positions uh, it's really important it's 
quite important to, to be a good communicator, uh, to be able to communicate complex things to, to a large audience. Uh, you need to have some problem solving skills. Uh, you need to be uh, great at teamwork as well because uh, data and analytics is a collaborative effort and, and you should leverage cross-team collaboration to produce better insights and better value for, for, for anyone. Then, uh, yeah, so as part of Tableau, we are as well uh, dedicated to, to bridging this data skills gap because there is, uh, this, there is still a, a big gap in terms of data skills. Uh, so that's why we've committed a few years ago to empower 10 million individuals with data skills by 2027. Um, and so as part of this initiative, we are offering free licenses to all students worldwide. And so this has been the case for many, many years, and it will always be the case. Uh, so if you are a student, you can use Tableau for free. Uh, we have free e-learning uh, as well through Trailet. Trailhead is a part of Salesforce. It's this, um, it's a place where anyone can improve uh, your their skills in in tech and and in, across Salesforce platform. Uh, you can do that for free from anywhere, and you can earn really um, globally recognized credentials uh, for for careers in the Tableau and Salesforce ecosystem. I also encourage uh, to to go through. Uh, official certifications from technology vendors. Of course, Tableau is great certifications that you can take um, officially, uh, but you have other great technology like Amazon, uh, Google, uh, etc., which which and, and Snowflake and and lots of other great technology which helps you uh, and provides you with uh, some. Um, some certifications, Databricks as well, and DataIQ for AI are great uh, technology vendors uh, that that you can yeah that you can train on and then take official certification to 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 add to your CV. And then to conclude, I think there's a a, a great expression that um, I took uh, from Audrey Hepburn, and she says, "Nothing is impossible." the world itself says I'm possible. Have you heard that, Kelly, before? Yes, I have. That's a that's a good quote. Yeah, I really like that one. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great reminder that I, actually anything is possible, right? Uh, you just need to be determined uh, to, to have the right beliefs and, and be, of course, perseverant. And then you should will be able to overcome any obstacle and, and and yeah do great things like shifting your career in data and analytics as you may have heard at the beginning of the podcast i mentioned that me and julie have actually met before in the past and that we recently both attended the women in big data event where i was hosting and i was interviewing her and I actually had some of the attendees approach me whilst at the event asking me about getting a job in Switzerland. And they were actually wanting to get your perspective and wanted to know if you had any advice for specifically getting into the tech industry in Switzerland. Yeah, for sure. So Switzerland is a, a really great place to work and it's actually home to many tech companies. And as well, it's uh, very often the headquarters of many global organizations. So it really offers a fantastic uh, opportunities in the job market in data analytics and AI. And so, of course, despite its small size, uh, it's got a huge tech community, uh, which makes it actually easy to network and connect across organizations. So I highly encourage to take advantage of those networking events. Uh, it's really crucial uh, to, to make connections and, and find job opportunities in the Swiss uh, tech industry. Uh, some of the great events in the Romandie region are, of course, um, Women in Big Data, where, where we met Kelly, uh, which will uh, reunite quite often uh, during the year. Uh, another great one is Women in Data Science. Uh, they reunite once a year around March, and, and it's really a great, a great event to to go to 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 learn from industry experts and to network. Um, I also 
uh, have heard of the women in tech, even so I didn't uh, participate here yet, but uh, they do as well uh, lots of great um, meetup uh, in in Switzerland. Some local data consultancy firms uh, also organize great data events. Uh, for example, one that I, I, I work with as well is Argusa, uh, which is based in, in Lausanne. They organize frequent thematic events on, for example, data governance, data analytics, data and AI, and it's always open and free to anyone. And, and they organize as well data challenges, data school. Uh, so yeah, great, great events to attend. I also highly encourage anyone to, to attend the Salesforce World Tour. Uh, this is happening once a year in Switzerland, uh, in Zurich, sometimes in Lausanne as well. A uh, great way to network with tech, um, tech companies and, and, and customers as well, leveraging uh, Salesforce ecosystem. Looking ahead, what excites you most about the future of AI? Well, I would say that we are at a really significant turning point uh, today uh, with AI and generative AI. Uh, so it makes it a huge, well, a incredibly exciting time to be working in data and analytics. Uh, I said it already, but the pace of innovation is really increasing exponentially. And so it allows us to automate tasks that are complex or boring, uh, to, to uncover insights faster, and, and to really focus our time on strategic activities. And so, of course, AI is redefining how people work, not only in data and analytics, but across all fields. And really enhancing productivity and creativity is, is what's key thanks to AI. So I'm, I'm quite thrilled about uh, what the future holds. Of course, we need to be cautious about security, trust, etc. But it's a really exciting time uh, to be working in data and analytics. And, um, and I really encourage highly anyone to, to, to start or continue their career in, in that area. And how best can people connect with you? Do you have any social media or anything else that people connect with you on? Yeah, so you can just uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I will always um, welcome that. And uh, and I as well speak quite regularly on local data events. I don't have any up to date today, but um, yeah, I speak at local events and, and global events, like for example, the Tableau Conference that is happening every year in San Diego around May. Great. I'll make sure to put your information in the description of the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for all the great quotes that you've used and the analogies. I feel like you've really helped paint a picture of um, the future of AI and the usage of analytics and why it's so important. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was really, really nice. Thank you, Julie, for joining us today and sharing your valuable insight. Your passion for AI and your commitment to empowering women in STEM is truly inspiring. Listeners, if you've enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite streaming platform, leave a review and rating to help us reach more listeners and follow our social medias the latest updates and behind the scene content. Join us next week for another exciting episode. And until then, keep exploring the world of STEM and empowering women in STEM.